who are going to speak to us and to encourage us this morning. And uh, what I want to talk about this morning, I uh, want to title it, Trust and Obey. And so if you have your Bible, which I believe you can read with us, uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, uh, from verse 1, I'm going to be reading this morning. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, from verse 1 to 22, I believe. And behold, there came a man of God to Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O oh, oh, altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Verse 3. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up. Oh, wonderful. So that he could not put it eat again to him. And the altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out on the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, and if you have your Bible, I want you to underline verse 7, because these are the crucial verses that we're going to be laying our foundation on this morning. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou give me half thy house, I will not go in, the, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. Verse 9, you can underline that. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way that thou comest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now there dwelt an old prophet. Now, this is very important. Now, dwell an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also to their father, and their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto me, uh, said unto him, Are thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For it was said to me, verse 17, by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, drink no water, then, nor turn to go by the way that thou camest. Verse 18, and he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. An angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, verse 18 is very crucial, bring him back with thee unto thy house, that he may eat bread and drink water, but he lied unto him. And so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Toss ye the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the man of the Lord that hath not and that hath not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee. 
but come back and but camest back and has eaten bread and drank water in the place for which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto thy sepulchre of thy father. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he sat up for him the asses to um, the asses to wait for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by, and the lion stood by the carcass. What a pitiful story. May the Lord bless his word in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. What a sad ending. What a terrible story. And this morning, I want to sound a note of warning to many of us today. The reason why I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to bring out this word again to us. Like we know, we are in a season of birth pain. And we have people crouching on their knees and their stomach, not because of a physical pain, but a lot of emotional pain, financial pain. There are distresses in life like never before. Marriage are in turmoil. Physically, people are struggling and a tendency to become desperate and wanting a quick way out becomes an option sometimes. And this is why I believe that God wants you to listen again and listen carefully, child of God. That God wants you to hear something this morning. And I, if you have your pen and if you're writing, Courage, and you can put it out there if you say the, the first thing I want you to write before I say anything because I want this to sink in because this is very important and I believe this is a word for us today. First thing I want to say to you is this trust begets obedience. If you don't trust me, you can't obey my instructions. On my word, you don't believe me, you will not take my word seriously. Trust begets obedience. And so Acts 26, verse 19 says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And number two, that I want you to write down as we go on today, this morning, lay the foundation. Every divine instruction comes with a price. Every divine instruction from God to you and to me comes at a price or with a price. If it's from God, it comes at a price. No divine instruction comes cheap. And that is why it is hard to take it. Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16, to say what? He said, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen person unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Listen to me. When God gives you a divine mandate or divine instruction, it doesn't necessarily come with all the, 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 the pomp and the pageantry and the comfort of life and the desires the way we used to think and I used to believe. I heard people say that as a young Christian going to a Western Bible college and I hear pastors stand before us and say, oh, when God called me, I had to make a deal with him. If he's not going to provide this for me, he's not going to give me this, then I'm not going to go. And we used to get excited and want testimony, but it's a lie from a Peter Why do you to negotiate with God? Write this down. This will help you and me. Every divine obedience comes with eternal reward, not external reward. Because when we are losing focus today, when we're getting carried away today, is that we think that everything that has to do with the kingdom of God has to do with this earthly realm. And we think our reward starts and ends here. And so we are building castles in the air in the name of prosperity, in the name of the blessings of God. 
But the blessings, every divine obedience from God comes with eternal reward fresh before external. So divine obedience is what secures my ticket to eternity. God is not interested in my eternity than my here. We lose sight of that. I lose sight of that every now and again. And God has to keep using people to remind me of that. Because we all get caught up in this realm, in this physical realm. When the bills are not getting paid, when I'm sick in my body, when I'm struggling financially, when I'm struggling in my marriage, when I'm struggling with my children, when I'm struggling in my place of work, the tendency for me to think and believe that that is all God is interested in about my life comes in because that is all I hear every day I go to church because it's about God blessing me because if I have faith, I can claim it, I can believe God. Every Everything is possible to him that believes it. That is true. But faith is more than just naming and claiming it. Paul says to the church in Galatians, he said, it is no longer I, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I believe. He said, it's no longer I that believe it, but Christ that lives in me. He said, the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who has crucified himself for me. That is to say, listen to me, child of God. I'm living by faith in the Son. Ah, even Paul has seen him. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Is that what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1? He said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I can see a house, I can see a car, I can see a truck. I can even see my wife. Or when I'm believing God for a good wife, I saw her, and so I can claim that. Amen. But how can I have faith for what I do not see? And so the Bible says in the same Hebrew chapter 11 that Moses continued strong because he could see him that was invincible. It takes faith to see Jesus. And it takes faith to begin to look like and walk like and act like Jesus. Amen. That you have not seen in the physical. And so the Bible says in the book of Acts, and it says the church and the children of God, or the disciples, were first called Christians in Antioch because they were acting and talking like the Jesus they heard about but have not seen. They mirror the image and the character of Jesus. And so the body obedience comes with eternal reward first. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. I will back it up with that. For our light, our affliction, which but for a moment, worked for us a far more exceeding and eternal word, weight of glory. In the midst of your affliction, if you can turn your focus away from the affliction that you're going through right now and begin to look unto him. The Bible says they looked to him and they were not ashamed and their face was lighter. What are you looking up to today? You can write this down. Obedience, I've said this time and time again, is your highest form of praise that you can offer the Lord. Not your money. Your obedience. And in this story, because the Bible talks about our affliction. Now we look at that prophet now, back to the story in First Kings chapter 13. He came all the way from Judah, the land of Judah. If back in the days there was no private jet, not even a truck to drive. Amen. So he had to trek. You know what I mean? And so because right now, if God, and I, I'm a preacher now, if I'm a big preacher, you know what I mean? If I'm a bishop or, you know, all the big names that come with it, and then they call me to go and preach somewhere in Africa, and I say to them, if you don't buy me a first class ticket, I'm not coming, because I need to be <laughs> The devil is alive. Amen. And we, we, we use God to promote our greed and our selfishness in this last days. So here was a prophet. He tried 
or walked or took a donkey, which was very uncomfortable. He was poor and hungry. And so he arrived at the place of assignment hungry because God knew he was going to be hungry. Let's go back to the story now. Because God said, when you go there, don't eat. <laughs> if God knew that he wasn't going to be hungry, that instruction wouldn't have been given to him. All right? Somebody come with me now. Let's think together. If God knew that he wasn't going to be hungry, then there wouldn't have been need for that instruction. The Lord knew that when, by the time he arrived at the place of assignment, he was going to be hungry and tired and thirsty. And the Lord says, when you get there, don't eat, don't drink. How can God be so mean? God, you sent me and you will not provide for me because that's what we talk about every day. How can God, where every vision comes with provision, but this vision does not come with provision. So how do we explain that? God did not provide. God, okay, you said I should not eat that, but you did not provide any food for me. Don't leave him. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Amen. But he God did not give him food that he would eat there. But he told him, don't eat there. And so now, he obeyed God. Now listen to what happened. When the king of the land, who was the richest man in that country, amen, richer than all the rich men today, if we can think about it, the king that was the king of the land that he went to address, offered him food and comfort, and he what? He rejected it in obedience to the word of the Lord. He said, though I am hungry right now, I will not eat anything, even if you give me half of all your house, all the wealth of your house, I am not taking, because the Lord has told me not to take nothing from this land. I should go back even in a different direction. He accepted God's instruction when he was offered comfort. But here is the catch. Now, this is where you and me are getting into trouble today. An old prophet showed up who had the appearance of God and the wisdom of God. A prophet that had lost touch with heaven. How come he fell? Why did he fall for the lies of the prophet? spirituality. We are easily carried away when they look like the path we fall for them. And so people are becoming gullible today that shouldn't be gullible. Men are forgetting their God-given assignment. Now this is something that caught my attention. Verse 18 of this same chapter we read. Now I want you to look at, I want to talk to us this morning. I want, I'm taking you somewhere this morning. Amen. Is, are you with me this morning? Yes. First Kings chapter 13 verse 18. Courage put it there. You should have find it. I want you to see something there that if we read that thing, and I've read it for a, a while, several times I never saw it until lately. Never caught my attention. Listen to this. The old prophet, and he said unto him, I'm a prophet also as thou. And then listen to the next statement. An angel. Ah, superficial spirituality. An angel. How many times today you, you go to some meetings? And they will spend hours talking about 
angelic visitation, how the angels showed up and all this. And then we just get caught up. He started by saying, an angel. We want to give credence and make it look so spiritual and so out of this world. An angel spoke to me. Now, when you read the scriptures, when the Lord spoke to the man, he didn't use an angel. <laughs> when God gives divine instruction, he speaks to them directly and says, the Lord said to him, but this fake prophet came to him and said, an angel said. And suddenly, his guard fell. How many times do you go? And then you hear people talk about how this angel came. An angel, she saw this angel was away. And he showed that. And suddenly your guard will fall and you think that, oh, this one, they've been to heaven ten times and back. And everything they say will be true. Lie. Test everywhere. Why do we know that? Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 has this to say. But though we are an angel, Courage, go back to the Lord when you say that then. Thank you. Because I want you to get this. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 says, though, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, other than that which you have been preached unto you, let him be what eternally cursed. If an angel should come, now the guy said an angel. In Colossians chapter 2, write these scriptures down because they will help you. Verse 18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward. In what? In voluntary humility, superficial spirituality, that's what I call it, and the worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, but being daily puffed up by his fleshly mind. They come up and begin to tell you stories of celestial things that they've never seen. They make up stories. I'm not saying that angels do not exist. I'm not saying that God, God does not send angels to people. That's not what I'm saying. But be careful what you take in. Test every spirit, the Bible says. What does it mean to be God? Is to trick or to deceive, or to hoodwink you, or to blindfold a person, or to deliberately. That I wrote myself. I was praying. I said, God, and it, and it means to deliberately conceal the truth from someone. And that is what is happening today in the church. To deliberately conceal the truth from someone with the intention of taking advantage of them. They deliberately conceal the truth from you because they have a mission in mind. So he said in verse 2, in verse 4 of the same Colossians, and said, This I said, this any man should beguile you with enticing words. This was the words that was used by this prophet to deceive this man, to disobey divine instruction. Verse 8 of the same Colossians, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil your true philosophy and bend the seat after the what? The tradition of men. Listen to me, child of God. Jesus speaking in John chapter 10, verse 27. He said, My sheep hear my voice, not the voice of angels. My sheep hear my voice, not the voice of angels. When the Lord spoke to the prophet, if you read the whole story, go back again and read 1 Kings chapter 13. There was nowhere God sent angels to instruct this man. But he got carried away by superficial spirituality of that prophet. Listen to me in this difficult time. In your time of hunger and pain and destitution, 
That is why we are not susceptible to deception. When things are not going well in your life, that is where it is easy for people to come and deceive you. And that is where we must take our focus off this earth and continue to focus on heaven. I'm telling you, child of God, Jesus speaking, he said, in this world, you will have trouble and tribulation. Get used to it, child of God. It's not the best thing for us. It's not comforting. But because if you are not careful, if you are too desperate for solution, you become a target for deception. Miracle seekers are easy victims to this people. And I wrote here as a letter to this child of God. The voice of God is the voice of reason. And though it may not offer a quick solution, listen to me. The voice of God is the voice of reason. Though it may not offer you a quick solution to that problem that you are facing right now, It will do you a great good to trust them. The voice of God may not provide you food when you are hungry, like to this problem. But the voice of God, listen to me. The voice of God, you can write this down. And I, I heard that in my spirit this morning. And I tried to explain it to you. The voice of God will comfort you in your time of need. But the voice of God may not offer you comfort. The two different things. I will explain it. Amen. And I'll have a scripture to back that up because I don't say anything outside the word of God. The voice of God, when it comes to you in your time of trial and tribulation, will comfort you, but may not give you comfort. I explain that. So you are hungry at like that prophet. Right? God comes to encourage you and say, hold on a little while. He didn't give you the food that you need. Because what you need right now is food. The voice of God comes to you when you are sick unto death. What you need is healing right now. You want to be well and be strong again. The voice of God comes to you and say, hold on a little while. It will be all right in the morning. But I want to be all right right now. Because I want the comfort right now. I want my debt paid right now. I'm about to go. If my house is about to be repossessed. And the voice of God will say, it's okay. They're definitely going to take that house. But I have something better. I'm not giving you the comfort that you need right now. But my word will comfort you in a time of trial. Do you understand it now? And there is a scripture for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. Nevertheless, God that comforts those who are cast down, those who are already cast down, he said, nevertheless, God comforted those that are cast down by the coming of Timothy. They were cast down. God came to comfort them. He didn't take them out of their place of discomfort. He just came and strengthened them in that place and gave them strength. Listen to me. And that is why the story of this man is a story of miracle. It is very dangerous, child of God, to seek men's opinion when God has given you instruction. It is dangerous to consult with men when God has given you a difficult task to accomplish for him. To the voice of God. And he, listen to me. Don't have said it. This is the what son is going after me. Do not compare your life with other people's lives. Others may, but you may not. Amen. Others may do it, but God will say, don't do it. The fact that somebody else is going to Jericho does not mean that you should go. 
It doesn't mean the person going is wrong. It just simply means that is not God's divine instruction. Look for your own manual for life. Let God speak to you directly. Don't depend on other people for your life. Paul speaking in Galatians chapter 1 verse 17, he said, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, verse 16 says, to reveal his son in me, that I, that I might preach him among the hidden, immediately I did not confirm with what flesh and blood. I didn't consult any man. God is calling you in this difficult time to absolute obedience because there is a reward for every obedience. Every instruction given by God, if obeyed to the letter, comes with its own reward. The popular one that we know in the Bible said, Honor thy father and thy mother. He said, This is the first commandment with a promise. For every divine instruction given to you by God, you will do well to hearken unto the voice of God. Don't let men deceive you. Whatever you are going through, child of God, is just for a season. God is not a wicked God. If you have prayed and asked God to heal you, and he has not healed you yet. He doesn't mean he's not going to heal you. I want you to know that. There is no timetable with God. Don't put a time cap in anything that you're going through with God. Don't compare God's, somebody else's solution to your own solution. Don't say because God did it for him that way, that is the same way God is going to do it for me. No. As a classical example in the scriptures are those blind men. Jesus would look at a blind man and he would say, go wash. And he saw another one again and he would spit on him and rub more. The same problem, the different approach. God is speaking to you. Be careful. We are in a difficult time and season in life. There are many voices out there that carry different kinds of titles and coming to tell us. The Bible said about this man, they called him a prophet. He was an old prophet. I don't want to go into that detail about that. He was God, but he still carried the title of a prophet. God knew that he was in that town but yet he sent somebody else there because that showed that he has already failed God. Why did God need to send somebody all the way from another far away country or town to come and do what he is supposed to do? Because when you fail in your responsibility to God, heaven will replace you. There are many people today who are carrying the title of men of God, women of God, children of God that have been replaced by heaven. You be careful. The Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them. While the king was busy blaspheming the name of God in his own town, he was in his house, sleeping and enjoying his time away. And a young man came. And out of envy and anger, or whatever his motive or intention were, he destroyed and cut short the life of this young prophet. What kind of hunger you are going through? I don't know what your hunger is this morning. I don't know what is being delayed in your life, in your marriage, in your home. And even after God has spoken unto you, and you have followed God faithfully and done everything that he asked you to do yet he has not yet provided always hear the word yet it doesn't mean God is not going to provide I wish when I read this story every time I wish this guy would have followed God to the letter I wanted to know how his end would have become 
Many people have aborted their destiny on the altar of greed and impatience. And God is saying, child of God, in this difficult time, don't let men deceive you. Because obedience simply means to comply, to submit, to conform, to follow instruction, to do as ordered or instructed by the Father. And I want to give you quickly the benefit of divine obedience. And I believe that if this guy has stayed the cross and run the race, Paul said what? He said, I have kept the faith. Would it be said of you and me that through it all, we have kept the faith? I know things are tough. I know you are the point of throwing in the towel. I know you have been tempted to go seek solutions somewhere else. <clears throat> the child of God, wait on God. Don't be carried away by every wind of doctrine out there. Open your Bible. Open your Bible. Open this word and read. Everywhere you read in chapter 13 of 1 Kings, the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord came. The only one that was alive was the one the angel spoke. I'm not into trouble. Amen. I believe in angels. I believe they are ministering spirit, the Bible says, said to those who shall be heirs of salvation. They are not to be worshipped. Angels, their words are not to be exalted above the word of the Father. So Paul said, even if an angel that is the most rebel should come to you and me and preach another gospel outside of this, let him be cursed. Now, how would you even know that the angel is lying to you when you don't even know this? Amen. Huh? How would you know that they are lying to you when you, the last time you opened this Bible that you have was last year Christmas. <laughs> Amen. And you keep hearing, oh, my pastor said, whether he's telling the truth or not, it doesn't matter. Oh, this, uh, this bishop said, oh, this man, we go on social media, and then they put a picture of one popular pastor and put a quote by him whether it is true or not, because it's there, we just follow the way. Open this book of life. Number one, quickly here. Divine obedience guarantees you and gives you access to the author of our eternal salvation, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Number two, divine obedience creates an atmosphere for supernatural miracle and visitation of the Lord. When you obey, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 says, If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the wood of the land. Number three, divine obedience puts you and me in a position of authority. Last time. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. That's the scripture that goes with that. Because everything we say has to be backed up from here. We don't have to be eloquent just for the fun of it. We have to speak the mind of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 says, Having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when the obedience is what? Complete. <laughs> and so when your obedience is complete, then you can take care of anything. Then your obedience puts you in a place of authority and power. And so you know the story of the seven sons of Sceva, 
when they were trying to take control of a madman. The madman said to them, what? Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Whose are you? What does, this, what does that mean? He was saying, under whose authority? You cannot be a rebellious child trying to cast another rebel. It doesn't work. Amen. <laughs> because the devil is the father of all rebels. So you cannot be living in disobedience and then coming to stand before another disobedient man and say, you. And they said, no. So in Matthew chapter 8, which I want you to write down for me, about the centurion, he came to Jesus. He said, I'm a man in authority and under authority. Now, so before you can be placed in a place of authority, you must be submitted to the heavenly authority. He said, he said I'm a man under authority and in authority, so I know how this thing works. So Jesus, all you have to say is speak the word because I know that you are submitted to a higher authority. Jesus said, as I hear my father speak, I speak. What I see my father do is what I do. I don't play crack. Number four, obedience makes you a distinguished, special person in the eyes of your heavenly father. Exodus chapter 19 verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice in thee, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be what? A peculiar treasure unto me above all the people of the earth. This is what obedience does. Obedience sets you apart for honor. And that is why the enemy will do everything to make sure that you are now walking complete disobedience to the word of God, to the instructions of heaven. That is the only way he can get us where he wants us. Number five, quickly. Obedience will provoke heaven to take on your battle and fight for you. Exodus chapter 23 verse 22 is the scripture for that. But if thou should indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, now listen again, obey what? His voice. What is a voice? I've told you this time and time again. A voice is any sound with authority and power. So anytime you open this word and begin to speak it out, you are speaking from a platform of power and authority. And so the Bible says, God speaking to the children, He said, if you will indeed obey my voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemy too. And I'll pass with you as last week. You want God to fight your battle? Learn to obey God. Quickly, number six. Obedience will set you up for supernatural prosperity and unusual favor. Job chapter 36 verse 11 says, If they obey and serve him, they shall what? Spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Simple. Seven. I love this one. Obedience makes you a territorial commander. Amen. It puts you in charge. It was obedience that put that young prophet in charge of the king. Right? You remember when the king raised up his hand to strike him, what happened? His hand became withered. He stepped into the territory of the king without fear. Because when he was walking in complete obedience, heaven was backing him up. So when he stepped into the king's territory, he took charge. He took charge. Obedience puts you in charge. The Bible says what? He said, as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. Finally, the king. Obedience, first, number eight, guarantees your blessings from the Lord. I'm talking about generational blessing. When you obey God, you are setting the stage for your children's 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 children. And when you rebel, you are setting the stage for a dysfunctional generation. The choice is yours. You're willing to obey God in some way and let Him finish what He has started. 
As we pray this morning, in Genesis chapter 12, the God called Abraham and said, Leave thy people and thy country and go. He said, When you get to the place I'll show you, Abraham obeyed. And that's why we can sing today, Abraham's blessings are mine. What is eating you up, child of God? Learn to wait for the Lord. I'm telling you, God is not done with you yet. When Abraham obeyed God, the reason why we are hearing and reading of Abraham and talking about Abraham is because his obedience, he was obedient. He was not disobedient to the heavenly vision of God. Times are going to be tough. But stay the cause. Stay faithful to what God has called you. Stay faithful to that divine instruction of heaven. And I tell you, child of God, God is not going to let you down. When we walk with our he abide with us. I'm not for that word. That song. Okay, can we sing that this morning? When we work with our Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He sheds on our way. When we do His good will, He abide. Prophet. He was hungry and tasty. 
I don't know what the hunger of your life is this morning that's put you to a point of desperation. And you are on the point of throwing in the towel and just giving up and accepting anything that comes. You want to settle for defeat. You are at the point of giving in. And you are so close to that breakthrough. You are so close to that miracle. But the enemy is tying the knot around you and saying the choice you've made for the Lord is going to cost you. Listen to me. There is no man who has gone all the way with the Lord that has ever regretted it. Have the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to trust God in the midst of this difficult situation that you're in right now. Because he that will come will come and not delay. In just a little while, the Lord will show up. Ask God to also help you to have a vision of heaven, a sight of eternity, because it's all about there, not here. What God is more concerned about is there, not here. Everything here is just a shadow of the reality of what we're looking for, what we're working towards. This is not our home. We are the only people that go on vacation and don't want to leave. We are on vacation on this earth, child of God. That reality has to sink into us. That whatever we're going through is temporal. So Paul said, though our outward man waste away, we do not fear. I know things are tough, but God is saying, I've got you covered, child of God. Father God, I pray for that divine covenant that will give us strength in the midst of our storm. Lord, that anyone that is at the point of being sunk in into the deception of the enemy, to settle for a negative and wicked autonomy, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will snatch them from that way of destruction this morning in the name of Jesus. Let hope rise in them again. Like we started this morning with Job chapter 10, verse 12. Lord, because you have granted us life and favor, I pray, Father God, that your visitation, O oh God, will preserve a soul from dying, from giving up, from quitting in the name of Jesus. Visit them, O oh God, and encourage them like you did for Elijah. Before the wicked fake prophets, O oh God of our time, lay hold of these children of yours, O oh God, wherever they are. Let your Holy Spirit visit them and encourage them. And say, though you are suffering, child of God, you are still in the will of your Father. Though you are sick in your body, you are still in the will of your Father. Though you may be barren, you are still in the will of your Father. Though you may be divorced, you are still in the will of your Father. Though men have rejected you and have called you names, you are still in my will. Stay the cause and hold up. Your story is not going to end the way it started. There is hope for your future. There is hope for a tree even if be cut down at the scent of water. That water is the word of life. Speak life into your situation, child of God. And watch what heaven is going to do. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine his face of favor upon you and your household this year like never before. May this year not end for you in shame. May he that is the glory of Israel show up for you and have mercy upon you. May mercy speak for somebody here where there is condemnation and rejection in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we go, can we... Uh,